wizard on air conditioning troubleshooting. He can read those gauges as easily as most of us read the Sunday comics. Jim Collins is a top-notch tune-up man. He's talked Pete into teaching him some of the fine points of air conditioning troubleshooting. Let's move in on the conversation. I'm sure that all of us can learn a lot from this session. Hi, Jim. Hi, Pete. Mind if I do a little kibitzing? Glad to have you, Tech. Suppose you and I do the talking and let Jim do all the work. Sounds good to me. How about giving me a quick rundown on what you've already covered with Jim? I'll let Jim tell you himself. That'll give us a check on what he's learned so far. This air conditioning system worked like a charm until a few days ago. Air circulation's still good, but the refrigeration part of the system's not doing much cooling. So far, we've checked out the controls, clutch and drive belts for possible slippage, and we removed the heater outlet hose to make sure there's no hot water flow through the heater flow valve and the heater core. Pete had me test the expansion valve thermal bulb contact. It's wedged tightly in the suction line well, so we know the expansion valve's getting good temperature signals from the evaporator suction line. The condenser fins are clean as a whistle. I've checked every refrigerant line to make sure there aren't any kinks that might restrict refrigerant flow. I even checked the subcooler for kinks or fin damage. This baby's been warming up at 1,200 RPM with the controls on fresh cool, blower high, and windows open. The dry eye is still blue, so the system's not wet. The sight glass shows a solid stream of refrigerant, completely free of foam, so we know it's not low on refrigerant. The gauges are all connected and purged of air. The tachometer's connected, and I'm raring to go. Whew. What's next, Masters Tech and Pete? <laughs> Sounds like you've just about purged yourself of air and breath, Jim. Well, you've certainly got all those important preliminary inspections down pat. That he has, Tech. You'd be surprised how often those preliminary inspections and tests turn up the cause of trouble. When they don't, it's time to start reading the clues these test gauges can give you. Trying to work without them is worse than putting a jigsaw puzzle together blindfolded. Are we going to run overall performance test on this job, Pete? No, Jim. The cooling on this car is so inadequate, we don't need a performance test to prove it. As a matter of fact, air-conditioned cars have been coming through in mighty good working order the last year or so. Thanks to better design, production, and quality control, a performance test isn't necessary. Unless you want to prove to a customer that extreme humidity and heat can make the performance of the best air conditioning system seem questionable. Or when you're not sure yourself whether performance is up to standard. Tech's exactly right, Jim. Now let's get on with the lesson in gauge work. Notice that the discharge pressure gauge in the center is connected to the compressor discharge service port. It will always show compressor discharge pressure when the discharge gauge needle valve is open. What's that needle valve for? Use that needle valve to damp out oscillation of the discharge gauge needle. You can't get accurate readings if it's waltzing all over the dial. Turn that valve clockwise just enough to steady the needle. Don't close it all the way or the gauge won't register. Thanks, Tech. I'll remember that. The suction pressure gauge at the left registers evaporator suction pressure. The hose for this gauge is connected to the suction service port. Give or take a few pounds, it'll tell you the pressure and the approximate temperature of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator. You mean this pressure reading of 45 pounds means the evaporator temperature is about 45 degrees? The temperature of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator is actually several degrees warmer than that, about 55 degrees. And that gives us our first clue. The suction pressure, or pressure of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator, should be about 30 pounds. This would mean a refrigerant temperature of about 32 degrees, right around the freezing point for water. That proves that this evaporator is too warm, then. You're on the right track, Jim. Pete will explain a couple other gauge clues that'll help tie it down a bit tighter. Notice that discharge gauge, Jim. It reads about 200 pounds. Normal for a day like this. The compressor inlet pressure reads 45 pounds, the same as the evaporator suction pressure. Does that tell you anything about the evaporator pressure regulator valve, Jim? Let me think about it. The EPR valve is located between the evaporator suction service port and the compressor inlet service port. Since the gauges connected to these two ports register the same pressure, 
the EPR valve must be open. Right, Jim. It also means that the open EPR valve isn't controlling or restricting refrigerant vapor flow. Doesn't it also prove that the expansion valve is at fault and that the EPR valve's okay? Not quite, Jim. It puts the finger of suspicion on the expansion valve, but it doesn't prove that the EPR valve is operating within specifications. Tech's right, Jim. As long as the suction pressure on both suction gauges is high, 45 pounds, there's no way of knowing whether the EPR valve is capable of controlling minimum suction pressures. I see. Can you tell from these gauge readings what's wrong with the expansion valve? I can make a good guess. The expansion valve is probably stuck open, and the evaporator is flooding with liquid refrigerant. That liquid refrigerant is trying to take on heat and vaporize, but there's no room left for expansion. Evaporator heat makes the suction pressure abnormally high. Then I suppose that a low evaporator suction reading and poor cooling would mean that the expansion valve is restricting refrigerant flow. Right, Jim. And if the thermal bulb loses its charge, both suction and compressor inlet pressure will pull right down to zero or lower. What's next on the schedule? The compressor capacity test, Jim. There's a good reason for testing the compressor before the expansion valve. Leaking compressor reed valves or gaskets would upset expansion valve test results. We have to be sure of the compressor before we can test the expansion valve. Besides that, since the system must be discharged for the expansion valve test, it's good insurance against comebacks and mistakes to make sure the compressor's okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. Any special precautions or instructions on discharging the system? Yes, Jim. Be sure and discharge the system slowly to avoid sweeping refrigerant oil out with the escaping refrigerant vapor. You'll find complete compressor test preparation instructions in the manual. Put on these goggles to protect your eyeballs. A drop of refrigerant will freeze them before you can blink. While Jim's finishing his test hookup, one of you men out there can do your part by flipping the record over. Looks like you followed instructions to the letter. Start the engine and adjust idle to 500 RPM. Test results don't mean a thing unless engine speeds control to exactly 500 RPM. Get ready to run this test fast. Running the compressor as an air pump for more than five minutes could cause overheating and serious damage. Engine's idling at 500 on the button. What's next? Slowly close the suction gauge valve. All air delivered by the compressor is now discharged through the test cap. The discharge gauge should register a minimum of 190 pounds when discharge air is metered through the carefully calibrated test cap orifice. Pressure is steady at 185 pounds. Yeah, but notice that the pumping load has dropped engine speed to 480 RPM. Increase speed to 500 and watch that pressure build up. There. Engine speed is exactly 500 RPM. Pressure is steady at 198 pounds. This compressor is okay. Open that suction gauge valve to drop the pressure, then close it to double check the pressure buildup. Pressure is up to 195 pounds and engine speed is still 500 RPM. I'll turn off the ignition before the compressor gets too hot. I was wondering if you'd remember that, Jim. Glad to see you're on the ball. What do you do when a compressor doesn't pass the capacity test? You replace both valve plates and head gaskets. There's no way of knowing for sure which cylinder is causing the trouble. Now, reconnect the suction and discharge lines to the compressor while Tech and I round up a batch of ice cubes and a pan of warm water. Just follow these expansion valve test preparation instructions, Jim. I know what to do next. I put the can of refrigerant in this pan of 125 degree water to maintain refrigerant vapor pressure. Being sure, of course, not to tip the can and dump liquid refrigerant into the test lines. This ice and water will be used to immerse the thermal bulb, thereby closing the expansion valve for the minimum flow test. That'll come later. Right now, if you'll be so kind as to warm that thermal bulb in your hand, Pete, I'll adjust this discharge pressure gauge valve to maintain exactly 75 pounds 
so I can test the expansion valve's maximum flow pressure. Nice going, Jim, but for Pete's sake, quit stealing the instructor's lines. Don't worry about me. I'll get my licks in later. I know Jim's been boning up on this test. All right, wise guy, what do the gauges tell you? Both gauges register the same pressure, exactly 75 pounds. That means the expansion valve isn't controlling maximum flow at all. It also proves that your original guess about the expansion valve flooding was right. Pete wasn't guessing. He was doing a good job of reading and interpreting gauge pressures. We're not quite through yet. I've put the thermal bulb in ice water so the expansion valve will close down to its minimum flow setting. Adjust that discharge to 75 pounds again and see what pressure you get on the suction gauge. Suction gauge pressure, 75 pounds. Discharge gauge, 75 pounds. Minimum flow specifications call for 21 to 25 pounds suction pressure. This valve is stuck wide open. Since you do such a good job of following manual instructions, you won't have any trouble replacing the expansion valve, sweeping, testing for leaks, evacuating and recharging system, so we can test the EPR valve. I guess I asked for it. Say, Pete, do you mind answering a few more questions while I labor? Not at all, Jim. I'm pleased as punch the way you are taking to this air conditioning service work. What general service precautions do you consider most important? I mean, those in addition to the ones you've already given me on testing. On new cars, before they're delivered, always test for leaks. It doesn't take long to make a thorough leak test, and it's good insurance against other troubles that can result from loss of refrigerant. A system that's tight and properly charged will keep its charge. Moisture in a refrigeration system spells trouble with a capital T. Always pull a vacuum of at least 28 inches to get rid of all moisture-carrying air in a system that has been opened for repair or testing. Always replace the dryer after completing the sweep test and before evacuating or pulling a vacuum. That's so any moisture already in the system will be trapped and held in the old dryer. And be sure to keep it clean. A little dirt can cause a lot of trouble. It's easier to keep dirt out than it is to remove it once it gets into the system. Right. Cap all lines and fittings as soon as you open them. Don't ever overcharge the system. Too much refrigerant is a lot worse than too little. An overcharge will reduce cooling and may damage the compressor. Whatever you do, keep refrigerant containers upright. Avoid tipping a refrigerant can, laying it on its side or turning it upside down while charging the system. A slug of liquid refrigerant fed into the suction side of an operating compressor will damage the reed valves for sure. It looks like you've got that new expansion valve installed and the system back in operation. Push the max cool button, put the blower on high, and close the car windows. All the gauge connections are right for the EPR valve test. Engine speed's a bit low. Adjust it to exactly 1,250 RPMs for the EPR test. Okay, Tech. That's 1,250 right on the nose. What's next? Just keep your eyes glued to that suction gauge and compressor inlet gauge. Notice suction pressures pulled down to 35 pounds already. Hey, Pete, look what's happening to these gauge readings. The evaporator suction pressure is down to 24 pounds, and the compressor inlet pressure is fluttering at about 23 pounds. What does that mean? That compressor inlet gauge flutter signaled the point at which the EPR valve started to function as a modulating valve to control evaporator suction pressure and evaporator temperature. Now, as soon as compressor inlet pressure pulls down to 15 pounds, read the pressure registered at the evaporator suction gauge. Evaporator suction pressure is steady at 24 pounds. Is that okay? It sure is, Jim. A minimum suction pressure of 22 to 26 pounds when compressor inlet pressure is 15 pounds or lower means the EPR valve is okay. It is capable of providing maximum cooling without danger of evaporator frosting. I suppose that a reading above or below those suction pressure specifications would mean that the EPR valve should be replaced. Right, Jim, but with one exception. On 1960 models, the valve is on the outside and can be adjusted. You'll find instructions for making that adjustment in the reference book. If this reference book covers all the tips Pete's given me today, it'll come in mighty handy, Tech. That it will, Jim. And just remember this. 
These test gauges are the most valuable diagnosis instruments an air conditioning serviceman can have. You can say that again, Tech. Now, before I bow out on this session, I want to thank Pete and Jim for a job well done. And I also want all of you men out there to give some serious thought to this idea. If you and the rest of the 30,000 men in the tech program will put in a good word for your dealership, service department, your line of cars every day for a month, you'll spread that good word to nearly a million prospects for service and your line of products. Something to think about, isn't it? Thank <laughs> you.